Well, I, I'm not sure about the uber smart, uh, uh, smart stuff. But thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you, uh, Ed, uh, uh, and the Public Policy Forum for inviting me to Ottawa. I haven't been here for a little while, so it's, uh, it's great to be here when the weather is pretty good. So, my w mind uh, works in funny ways. Uh, I spend a lot of my time watching for anomalous phenomena, uh, and then I store them up until I could make sense of them. So I remember vividly watching the 1998 uh, Nagato Winter Olympics, and the biggest star, you may recall, was Austrian downhiller Hermann Meyer, the Hermanator, as he was called. So I watched this race live, And like everybody else, and you, uh, you uh, played your role perfectly, <laughs> was, was shocked to see Meyer fall so spectacularly. Uh, now, since you are also worried, Tony, he did actually recover perfectly and, and win two golds after that. So, uh, uh, much to everybody's surprise. Uh, but at the time, I remember thinking that he was wearing a super efficient ski suit <laughs> for when he was upright with near to zero friction, but when he fell, he didn't slow down one iota and crashed spectacularly through the barriers thanks to his frictionless, frictionless suit. So that was my memory. But I just, I just you know, it went in there and I just left it be for, for 20 years. And then it became clear to me how this fit in and why, it, why I paid attention to it. And that is because in economics and business, we have had a two and a half century love affair with efficiency, and it's starting to have Meyer-esque negative consequences. So our love affair with efficiency started arguably with Adam Smith and the pin factory featured in The Wealth of Nations, published in, in 1776, coincidentally the official inauguration of the great American experiment. Division of labor made the pin factory vastly more efficient than it would have been uh, had each worker made entire pins from start to finish, as we know. Then in 1817, David Ricardo piled on with the theory of comparative advantage in, on principles of political economy and taxation, arguing that it would be more efficient for Portuguese workers to make wine and English workers to make cloth and trade with each other rather than both uh, countries making wine and cloth and not trading. Management, the field of management, took up the efficiency cause in earnest at the turn of the 20th century with Frederick Winslow Taylor, whose scientific management principles argued for organizing and structuring work to absolutely maximum efficiency using time and motion studies uh, to optimize the work. Then, after World War II, American W. Edwards Deming went to Japan and revolutionized their industries by introducing total quality management, which was designed to drive out all waste of all forms from a company's operating system. In due course, his techniques were accepted and built upon in America, his home, and around the world, and have helped inspire efficiency-oriented movements like Lean and Lean Six Sigma, which are the rage in, in uh, management today. Together, Smith, Ricardo, Taylor, and Deming powered a uniform and unquestioning love for economic and managerial efficiency in America and abroad. It's reflected in multilateral organizations like the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, GAAP, and the World Trade Organization, and is ensconced in the Washington Consensus with its insistence on trade and foreign direct investment liberalization, efficient forms of taxation, uh, deregulation, privatization, transparent capital markets, balanced budget, and waste-reducing governments. And it's reflected in, I can promise you, the curricula of every business school on the planet. More efficiency is just plain better is the rule. It has gone so far as to encroach deeply on the historical economic policies like antitrust, where in both the United States and the EU, merger partners can justify monopolizing effects of their mer merger by claiming there will be a net efficiency benefit of the merger. Even if that efficiency benefit is likely to accrue substantially, if not entirely, to the merger partners. In capital market regulation, derivatives upon derivatives upon derivatives are allowed even if they do create financial weapons of mass destruction, as Warren Buffett said, that were visited on the global economy in, 19, in 2008 and 9, because they are seen to help narrow bid-ask spreads 
and hence increase the efficiency of capital markets. And in international monetary fund bailouts, aid packages are tied to requirements for things like trade liberalization. It has been nothing short, in my view, of a smoking hot love affair, efficiency and the modern economy, like Anthony and Cleopatra, Napoleon and Josephine, Bogart and McCall, or Tracy and Hepburn. But as the love affair has progressed, some challenges have appeared. Income inequality in America is rising. We've all seen this. The rich are getting richer uh, now, more richer than ever before in American history. They are taking a vast majority of the benefits of the economic growth. In, 80, in 1980, the benefits of economic growth were much more widely distributed. Now the benefits of economic growth are, are now in the tail of the distribution, the extreme tail of the distribution. And with that, the, the median income, household income is stagnating. And it's for longer period of time than has been identifiable in the past. Now, for pre-World War II times, the need, you have to infer from the mean to estimate what likely happened to the median because we don't have fantastic median statistics before that. But it's not just winning individuals. Winning companies are winning bigger than ever. Okay. So this is, this is the share of income of all publicly traded companies of the top 100 companies in the, in the United States of all 8,000 companies, the top uh, 100 companies, that's their share of income. And now, the largest 28 S&P 500 companies, so the largest 28 of the S&P 500, earn the same total profits as the other 472 combined. And they're getting more powerful still. Across industries, the productivity of leading companies is rising precipitously, while the productivity of the rest of companies is falling, and falling a lot. Individual winning products and services like iPhones, Facebook, Amazon, and Google are winning bigger. Even at a narrower level, individual winning SKUs are winning bigger, single products. And individual winning cities like San Francisco and New York are winning bigger than they've ever won before. And in all cases, the losers are losing bigger. This is not a problem in and of itself. Winning is good. Perhaps it's the best, best manifestation or expression of the pursuit of excellence. The problem is the collateral effect. What is remaining for the rest is just too little, whether it's other people, other companies, or other cities. Of all such challenges, the most worrisome is, in my view, the stagnation of family income. Median family income is symbolically important because in democratic capitalism, the median family is not a bad proxy for the swing voter. The voter who represents the winning party getting 51% of the vote. For democratic capitalism to continue to be a system of choice, the median family has to support it. And for the median family to support democratic capitalism, it has to provide hope for a better, more prosperous future. There's no doubt that long-term stagnation of the median income represents a consequential challenge to the support of the electorate. The Great Depression was the last time America and most of the world experienced a long period of median income stagnation. Depending on how it's measured, the median income didn't return to its 1929 level until somewhere in the early 40s. You can argue whether it was 42, 43, or 44. But during that period, if you recall, most of Europe went either socialist, communist, or fascist. America stayed true to democratic capitalism though shifted economically to the left. But in that period, while the median income fell substantially in America, the incomes of the top 1% and 10% fell even more dramatically. So the median American household during the Great, uh, Great Depression was able to tell itself that even though the current situation sucks totally, at least all Americans, rich and poor, are in it together. Now the only truly valid thing the American family can say, the, uh, the median American family can say, is that things suck for us, but it's never been more awesome time to be the top 1% or the top 10%. Never been as good a time. And it's getting more awesome for them with every passing day. And these periods of median income stagnation that, that you see here are as long or longer than history. 
of America. So it's not a small thing. So it begs the question, what's the fundamental disconnect between how we think about democratic capitalism and the current economic situation? So democratic capitalism, in my view, is implicitly based on, the, on a Gaussian or normal distribution. The basis is, the basis is not explicit, but is implicit, and for a not surprising reason. Right? There's a reason why a Gaussian distribution is also called a normal distribution. Lots of things about human beings are, and nature are normally distributed. For example, human height, weight, and intelligence are normally distributed. So we think that something is normal, normal if it's normally distributed. Virtually all the practices of statistical analysis assume outcomes that are normally distributed. So it's no surprise, at least to me, that democratic capitalism is predicated on the notion of a large class of voters that has an interest in the, vote, in the functioning of the economy. The middle class that is distributed around a mean income, about one standard deviation to each side. And a vibrant and large middle class is seen as the missing element in most developing economies when they struggle to adopt or sustain economic, democratic capitalism. So the idea behind democratic capitalism is of an economy that features some poor people who their fellow citizens need to help, some rich people who with their greater means need to contribute disproportionately to the greater good, and then a big bulge of people in the middle. And together, they all vote to perpetuate a system that works for them. And writ large, the key goal of democratic capitalism is to raise the median over time to move the whole Gaussian distribution slowly but consistently to the right. But while that may appear to be the natural, the normal way things should work, something very different has transpired. The US economy is going Pareto. The concept of the Pareto distribution is named after Wilfredo Pareto, an Italian economist who observed a century ago that 20% of Italians own 80% of the wealth of Italy. The economic outcome of wealth was not normally distributed or anything close to that. The Pareto distribution looks different and has entirely different dynamics. The median is squished and the, and the median is typically not the mode. There are more incidents clustered at the low end and the tail of the distribution at the high end extends and extends farther out than any Gaussian distribution. When a Pareto curve of incomes is converted to a distribution of wealth, that long tail of incomes converts into a curve that shows wealth distribution more extreme than Pareto observed in Italy 100 years ago. The characteristics of a Pareto distribution starkly contrast with the Gaussian distribution in a number of very important ways. There is no meaningful mean or median in a Pareto distribution. There is no standard deviation that means a thing. It is not a stable distribution. Unlike a Gaussian distribution where additional data points are, when they're added, the distribution reverts more closely to the standard pattern. In Pareto distributions, they revert to no standard and can keep getting more extreme. Employment income in the U.S. takes on a distribution that is more Pareto than Gaussian and is getting ever more that way. We have looked at wages in the Martin Prosperity Inst Institute, along with my colleague uh, Rich Florida, across the entire U.S. economy and split them into four categories based on two variables. The first is whether the job is, is situated in what Mike Porter describes as a clustered industry, an industry that, if you look at employment, it's found in only certain counties in the United States and not spread, uh, spread evenly. Uh, these industries spend more on capital, on being productive, and engage in more R&D and innovation uh, activities. That's because they can grow to scale because they're shipping outside their local jurisdiction. And by being more productive, they can pay their, their workers considerably more. The other kind of... Uh, 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 industry along this dimension are industries that are dispersed reasonably evenly across the counties of the United States. And that trade, and, and they trade only in their local geography. So that would be your local landscaping company, your local barber shop, uh, your, your local branch bank, etc. These industries don't have the motivation to spend capital 
or engage in the R&D and innovation and pay their workers considerably less as a consequence. So that's one variable, are you in, is your job in a clustered industry or a dispersed industry? The second variable contains the content of the jobs, regardless of their industry. So one kind of job is what my colleague Rich Florida characterizes as creativity intensive jobs. They require considerable independent judgment and decision making and pay considerably higher wages. The other kind of job is routine intensive job of the sort that necessitates employing very little independent judgment and decision making because, and because workers are more fungible, they're paid considerably less. If these two axes are combined, they produce four categories. A creative job in a clustered industry, a creative job in a dispersed industry, a routine in a clustered industry, and a routine in a, in a dispersed industry. The distribution of wages is dominantly Pareto distributed. What you can see, and this is the big yellow box, is almost 45% of jobs are in routine and dispersed and are tightly clustered in wages and occupy the low end of the distribution, earning 36% lower than the national uh, average wage. Another 16% of the jobs in the orange box beside them are routine and clustered and are somewhat higher wages but still considerably below the national uh, average. The creative jobs in the long tail with 25% in the creative and dispersed, uh, but earning much lower than the 14% in the catbird seat. Those are people who are creative, have a creative job that requires lots of independent judgment and decision making in a clustered industry. Their wages are much higher than any of the other three classes and range widely from high to extremely high. And if these 2012 results, which is the last year for which there's data available to, uh, to do this, are compared to the 2000 data, which isn't that long a period, you can see this pattern. And that is that the pattern is getting more extreme. The lowest paid category is growing quickly in numbers and its wage levels are sinking even lower. That's in only 12 years, a meaningful diminution of those wages in, in, a, in a mere uh, 12 uh, years. And the wages in the highest paid category are growing very fast. So the distribution of wages in America is getting further away from Gaussian and even more Pareto. So the factor that renders a distribution either Gaussian or Pareto is in the relation of the data points in the distribution to one another. So in a Gaussian distribution, the data points in the distribution are independent from one another. So take human height, for example. One person's shortness does not contribute to another person's tallness. <laughs> Hence, height is normally distributed. One person's intelligence does not contribute to another person's dullness, hence intelligence is normally distributed. In a Pareto distribution, the data points in the distribution are interdependent. Take fame, for example. Because attention is limited, the fame of one person takes away from the likelihood of fame for another person. Or consider wealth. Having wealth makes it more likely that one can produce more wealth from that initial wealth which makes the wealthy person more likely to become still wealthier than a person without wealth. In Pareto distributions, the, an effect becomes the cause of more of the given effect. So when one looks for whom to follow on Instagram, a key factor is what? The number of followers that various people have. In fact, if a person has few followers, he or she does not even get into the consideration set. However, famous people who already have lots of followers, like Kim Kardashian, who has 104 million followers at last count, are immediately attractive candidates simply because they already have lots of followers. The effect, many followers, becomes the cause of more of the effect, more followers still. Instagram followers are famously Pareto distributed, with very few famous people having the lion's share of followers and a large, large proportion with few, the median number, median number of Instagram followers of anybody on Instagram is between 150 and 200 followers. Not to be confused with 104 million. Internet aficionados like to think of this phenomenon as pertaining solely to technology, the network effect. You build the first platform on the internet and path dependence will make it dominate. But it happens across the entire economy. When you decide to buy laundry detergent, 
You observe that the shelf is chock-a-block full of tied boxes, bottles, and tubs. And you say to yourself, I guess this is a safe and logical choice to buy what everybody else is buying. Why do you think there are so few colors of cars on the road? With customization and paint technologies, there could be thousands. But there are only a few. White, black, silver, and gray now account for 76% of all new cars purchased in America. There are only nine total colors that have more than a fraction of 1% share. That's because when car buyers are in, uh, in a dealer showroom picking a car, they want to pick a color that others on the road already have. That's why color selections are becoming ever more narrow and Pareto distributed. The tendency of the economy to produce Pareto distri distributions is not new. In business, we've kind of known about this phenomenon for at least a half a century, but it wasn't identified as specifically Pareto which is interesting to me at least. In the 60s, there were two bodies of work that pointed in this direction. One was the Profit Impact of Market Strategies, PIMS, project that it began at General Electric in the mid-60s and was continued by the Marketing Science Institute. It studied the relationship between market share and profitability in given industries. And it found that the firm with the number one market share earned relatively wildly disproportionate profitability in most industries. The number two share company earned considerably less, but still a decent amount, and all the rest of the companies from three onward earned little or nothing. Though it was not called it at the time, it, that is a Pareto distri distribution. This famously inspired longtime CEO of G General Electric, Jack Welsh, to declare that if General Electric couldn't achieve number one or number two market share in any industry, they'd get out of the business. That is a Pareto enhancing, en enhancing uh, decision. Also, in the 1960s, uh, the father of business strategy, Bruce Henderson, who founded the consulting company Boston Consulting Group in 1963, declared that a central feature of business competition was the experience curve, the broad tendency across businesses for the production costs of a given product to fall by about 30% with every doubling of cumulative production. And so that's the general curve, and this would be the, the experience curve as applied to uh, the Model T Ford. When you draw it on a log-log chart, it comes a straight line. On the basis of this insight, Henderson's prescription was for corporations to price ahead of the learning curve to gain number one market share, which would mean that they would have perpetually lower cumulative uh, production and, and perpetually lower costs. That, in turn, would make them the dominant and most profitable uh, company in their industry. Though, though known mu uh, much for the experience curves and this prediction, he forecast, Bruce Henderson forecast, that all industries would trend towards monopolies if firms followed this approach. It could be argued that he predicted the current dominance of Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and Amazon 50 years ago. In any event, even though we saw this, neither economists nor business strategists really put this all together to see this work as indicating that Pareto distributions were more of a likely outcome than we would have imagined. So where does efficiency, I started out with an obsession with efficiency, where does it fit in this puzzle? It turns out that researchers in complexity theory, and Bill McKel McKelvey at UCLA has played a central role in influencing my thinking on this front, have identified factors that systemically push distributions towards Pareto outcomes. Two of the key features are increasing pressure on the system in question and increasing ease of connection between participants in the system in question. Okay? So increasing pressure and decreasing costs of connection. The illustration that they use is the collapsing sand pile, a favorite of complexity theorists. Sand piles co collapse in a Pareto dis distribution. Many grains of sand are added to a sand pile with no impact on collapse. Then that one extra grain is dropped on the pile and it starts a chain reaction by which the entire pile collapses. However, if the sand pile were built in low or no gravity context, it wouldn't collapse. It only collapses as a pressure applied by gravity is added and that last grain of sand is pushed down by gravity, hitting the other grains and starting the collapse. With respect to ease of connection, one can imagine a scenario of no connection. That is, if each grain of sand were placed in a superstructure that caused it not to connect with the other grains of sand, there would never be a pile collapse. 
But if the very structure of the sand pile, each additional grain of sand interacts seamlessly and automatically with the other grains already on the pile, and then the ease of connection is, is, uh, uh, is high. Hence, with gravity and easy ready connection, the sand pile displays a Pareto distribution. Now, to use a less theoretical and more practical example, consider the United States waste management industry before Wayne Huizenga, founder of Waste Management Inc., triggered the consolidation of the industry. There were thousands of little waste management companies, garbage collectors across the country. Each, had, each of them had one or maybe a handful of garbage trucks and routes that they would uh, serve with them. If you looked at the distribution of profitability of those thousands of waste management companies, it was a fairly normally distributed. There was a mean around which most garbage collectors clustered, some highly efficient one, bigger ones earning profits at the higher end, some weaker ones earning profits at the lower ends and probably on the way of going out of business. Wayne Huizenga looked at the cost structure of the business and realized the two big drivers were truck acquisition, garbage trucks are expensive and used so intensively they need to re be replaced with regularity, and maintenance and, maintenance and repair. Again, the intensive use meant that they, they, the maintenance was both costly and critical. So each small player bought trucks, one or maybe a handful at a time, and had a repair depot for one truck or maybe a, a handful of them. Huizenga, his insight, realized that if he bought up a number of garbage routes in a given region, he could do two things. First, he would have much greater purchasing leverage with the truck manufacturers and could acquire trucks for a lower price. Second, he could close down all the individual maintenance facilities and put up a big one that would be much more efficient than all the little ones. As he proceeded, the effect, being more efficient, became the cause of more of the effect. He generated the resources to keep buying small garbage companies and expanded into new territories, which made Waste Management Inc. bigger and more efficient still. That put competitive pressure on every small operator because waste management could come into their territory and underbid them for their contracts. They had a choice of losing money or selling out to waste management, a huge increase in pressure on the system. Like a sand pile collapsing, the industry quickly consolidated with waste management as the dominant player, earning the, earning the highest profit with fellow consolidator, a second one followed, followed in suit, Republic, earning decent profit at a somewhat smaller scale, and several considerably smaller would-be consolidating, earning little or no returns, and lots of tiny companies mainly operating at subsistence level. So our 250-year obsession with efficiency has put ever-increasing pressure on industries, both by opening borders and deregulating to, compete, to increase competitive intensity. And, of course, the lowering of communications cost, particularly with the arrival of the Internet in its full glory, has increased the ease of connection between participants in whatever system we wish to observe. For example, on fame, it takes a few clicks to figure out who is the most famous. How many Instagram followers does Kim Kardashian have? It would have been extremely difficult to compare the fames of, of stars like Kim Kardashian, Selena Gomez, or Justin Bieber 20 years ago. That would have been a lot of work. Now it takes seconds, one click. And it's interesting for Canadians, we now know that the world's greatest power couple might not be Bill or Hillary Clinton, Bill and Hillary Clinton, or Ivanka Trump and Gerald Kushner, or Beyonce and JC, but rather Selena Gomez, number one, with 128 million Instagram followers, and her Canadian boyfriend, Justin Bieber, with 92 million at uh, ninth place. But the fame business has become ever more competitively intense, because if you don't have a lot of Instagram followers, you're going to fall farther behind and never be famous. Together with increased pressure and ease of connection has turned fame totally Pareto. So where are we heading? Where therefore does this leave democratic capitalism? As we ramp up competitive pressure and decrease the cost of connections, we're going to see an ever more Pareto set of outcomes. If we don't like inequality now, we should steal ourselves for a lot more in the future. We should also prepare ourselves for more Trump and Brexit votes, where the electorate votes to blow it up. Whatever it happens to be, because to the electorate at large, it is not working. The other thing we should get used to is 
monoculture and their inherent instability and catastrophic vulnerabilities. The ultimate end to a Pareto distribution is a single dominant modality that produces all the outcomes. Once, almonds were grown in many places in America and around the world, but as growers better understood almond growing, they came to understand that the Central Valley of California is perfect, and I mean perfect, for growing almonds. Over 80% of the world's almonds are produced in one central valley. And almond growing, by the way, is estimated to consume 10% of California's water usage every year. It is a true monoculture. With epic efficiency comes inherent vulnerability. One extreme local weather event or one pernicious virus could wipe out 80% of the world's global almond production. Rather than producing robust, redundant, resilient ecosystems, our obsession with efficiency is producing fragile monocultures with all the buffers removed that are potentially vulnerable to catastrophic failure. No doubt they are efficient when they're working, like Herman Meyer skiing upright. But efficiency has a dark side. We are getting Amazon and I really wonder whether we should be better off in the long run if we got the Amazon instead, a robust ecosystem. I worry about what we're sacrificing in the name of efficiency, whether in retailing, healthcare, or air travel. We may be pushing down costs, at least in retail and air travel, and that's not to be taken lightly. But is the system we're producing one that is indeed sustainable for humans and or the planet? I think we have to think, rethink our obsessional drive for efficiency. There's a Laffer curve to efficiency. To some point, more is unequivocally better, but after a point, more efficiency just drives more extreme Pareto outcomes and damages the prospects for democratic capitalism. Endless increase in efficiency should not be the goal of public policy. However, changing that will be exceedingly tricky given that policy is entirely oriented to that single direction now. The goal should be a balance that doesn't push efficiency so hard that it produces Pareto distributions in company performance and individual income and wealth. This applies, I believe, to economic policy in general, but three areas I think are particularly important, antitrust, trade, and capital markets. In antitrust policy, the secular trend since the early 80s has been to loosen antitrust enforcement so, so as not to get in the way of efficiency. Efficiency has become the le legitimate uh, defense against monopolization enforcement. There's been an implicit belief that natural competitive forces will ensure that the dominant players will not be able to exercise and maintain their power. That trend needs to be reversed. Market domination is not acceptable outcome even if it was achieved through legitimate means. For example, internal growth. It isn't good for the world to have Facebook use its deep pockets from its core business to fund its Instagram sub subsidiary to attempt to destroy Snapchat by copying everything it does. It isn't good for the world to have Amazon uh, attempt to kill all the retailers. It wasn't good for the world for Intel to attempt to kill AMD by giving co computer manufacturers price di discounts specifically for not using AMD chips. Enforcement needs to be much more aggressive to ensure that there is a dynamic competition even if the scale of competitors means there is lower net efficiency. In trade policy, lower barriers to international trade should not be seen as an unalloyed good. Oops. Some friction is not only acceptable, but is also preferable. David Ricardo clearly identified the efficiency gains from trade, but did not see the adverse consequences for democratic capitalism, I believe. Policymakers should utilize various barriers to trade to ensure that few firms don't dominate national markets, even if such domination appears to produce maximum efficiency. By restricting the domination of Google and Facebook in its home market, China may be creating a better long-term competitive context than many other countries. While the general agreement on trade and tariffs may be good for efficiency, it might actually be net bad for democratic capitalism over the long term. In capital markets policy, the goal should not be maximum liquidity and minimal bid-ask spreads. A single liquidity pool with minimal transaction costs is likely to increase the pace at which capital markets produce Pareto outcomes. A better outcome for democratic capitalism is the embrace of multiple, somewhat uh, inefficient capital markets. 
Capital markets should no longer be allowed and encouraged to emerge, and regulations making it difficult to establish new capital markets should be reduced. There are other policy, these and other policy shifts will be difficult to implement because a guiding principle of maximizing efficiency is a much easier one to follow. Balance is always harder to achieve, but it is better for the future of democratic capitalism. Thank you very much.